Hey guys, Dr. Barry here, about to go live in a few minutes with the world famous Dr. John Lemansky of Biohack MD. We're going to be talking about leaky guts tonight, your leaky gut. Hopefully you don't have that, but if you do, we're going to talk about what it is, what you should do about it, etc. If you're watching this on the replay, you know you can leave your questions in the comments and one of us will try to come back and answer as soon as we get a chance. Hey, Carrie Brown, wouldn't it be cool if Dr. Lemansky and I can just get this to work the very first time? Hey, Vicki, we're going to see if that happens. There's Dr. Lemansky. Come back here. Calling Dr. Lemansky. Ah, oh, there he oh, is. What's up? What's up? Hey, doctor, how's it going? Doing good, man. How are you? Oh, doing great. I just had a full book at the clinic today. Don't you miss seeing patients in the clinic? You know you do. Uh, yeah. You do not. Do you? No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. I love my no. patients so, so very much. But some days, man, clinic is just like, shoot me. Yeah, you know, it's healthcare in America, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly yes. right. You look exactly. good, though. Oh, thanks, man. You look great, too. I was just about Thank to say you. that. Thank you. I got some sun. I got some vitamin D. <laughs> so where so, in the world are you right now, Dr. Lemansky? Are you in an I'm undisclosed in, location, or can you tell us where you are? No, I've been actually uh, more on social media in the last week than I have in my life. Um, no, I love I'm it. In, I'm in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Ah, San Juan. I saw yes. your... Your lovely wife went live on the streets of San Juan. It brought back fond memories for me. Did you grow up there? No, I did not. But I've been there with <laughs> Nisha Maria a time or two. Her family actually grew up there. Her grandparents, I guess. Was your dad? He was born in Miami? Yeah. So her dad was born in Miami, but, but her grandparents. Oh, he was born in Puerto Rico. Okay, yeah. yeah. And so she's the first generation American. Yeah. And she has family down here still, right? She does, yeah, absolutely. Uh, various yeah. cousins and and uncles and aunts and tias and tios and et cetera. How do you say et cetera Fun in Spanish? I don't know. It's probably the same, isn't it? Because it's funny Latin. how uh, funny how she doesn't want to introduce me to any of her cousins. Yeah, no, you don't get to meet any of her cousins. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nisha. I feel the love. You might get to meet her mom and dad, maybe, but definitely no cousins. <laughs> okay. All right. Good to know. Good yeah, to know. They're, they're business people down there. So, yeah. Cool. So what's going on, man? How you been? Have you had doing any good? awesome adventures you need to tell us about? Um, you know, just trying to tone it down a little bit. I haven't had a vacation in 10 years or so. So yeah. trying to make it a work vacation, trying to live some of the things that I, I re you know, recommend to people. Mm -hmm. um did some waterfall hikes nice. laying on the beach you know nice. working hard like you heck yeah man heck yeah. yeah and so you are you actually are vacating you're not just pretending to for social media you are actually smelling the roses and getting bitten by sand oh, yeah. fleas and, and uh, all that no sand fleas smelling <laughs> roses that are picked by my children off the ground so nice smell amazing yeah. um, i saw him at, i saw him out playing in the sand and the dirt i was like that's it right yes. there that's yes. how you get a strong microbiome playing the dirt that's right and different areas of the world you know yes, so definitely things things they're not used to but um yeah it's been fun well guys if you're watching this now and sharing this with us you know that you've got friends who are worried about their leaky gut or who have a leaky gut who need to be watching this. So click the share button. And then I think you can invite a bunch of friends. You're always yep. welcome to share this on your social media, on your Facebook sure page or in a group. We don't mind at all. We're trying to help lots of people. So we're talking about leaky gut tonight, doctor. Is that right? Yeah. You know, I've gotten a lot of email questions on social media about leaky gut syndrome. And I think it's a topic that a lot of people have questions about. Um, you know, you and I as medical professionals, when we say leaky gut syndrome, we get some eye rolls from uh, our colleagues, you yeah. know, and so I think um, in kind of the holistic uh, naturopathic world, you know, it's well kind of known that that is something that they, you know, talk about and the influence on people. And so I think it might be a good topic to talk about, you know, number one, what actually, I think we should start with the actual gut permeability, the barriers that protect us from, you know, the outside world. 
sure. then we can talk about some of our immune system responses. And then some of the newer research that's looking at, you know, is there such a thing as leaky gut syndrome? And then is it actually tied to some of the diseases that people say it's uh, tied to? Oh, and I think that's, that research is very worthy of being done because, you yeah. know, when you start talking about things like leaky gut, the reason we get eye rolls from some of our more conservative colleagues is because we're on the edge of medical knowledge. And right. so you can quickly start talking about things that, that nobody knows for sure. A lot of this is theory. A lot of this is hypothesis. <clears throat> but what's not theory and hypothesis is the symptoms that people have when they eat the wrong things. That's, that's right. not conjecture. They know black and white, yeah, I'm having that symptom. Correct. And so that has to be coming from something. And leaky gut, as of now, is the theory that sure seems to fit the bill. Yeah, and it goes back to medical research. So, uh, you know, most doctors are not going to talk about leaky gut syndrome because there's not many randomized control trials. There's really no randomized control trials looking specifically at leaky gut. Now, there are studies that look at things like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, um, IBS, things like that, which, you know, we can infer from some of those studies that, yeah, there is such a thing as uh, gut permeability, which is kind of the same thing as leaky gut syndrome. Um, and so, but as you said, I mean, there's no real randomized control trial. So doctors are not going to go out and say, yes, you have leaky gut syndrome because number one, there's not the research to back it up in their minds. And number two, uh, then what do you do about it? Right. right, exactly. And that's the big thing that I find with conventional doctors is if they can't help you with the answer to a question, they ain't going right. to answer, answer, they're not going to ask it. Right. Right. Or they're going to just kind of lump it into a new disease. So, you know, like one of the most common ones, I think, would be fibromyalgia. So, you know, it's really a compilation of symptoms. And because we don't really know what's driving those symptoms, we say you have fibromyalgia. Now, if you look at fibromyalgia and I don't want to get down a, a you know, rabbit hole, but if you look at how to do, uh, diagnose it, I mean, I could look at you and say I have 10 of those symptoms every day. Right. Yep, so I have exactly. pressure point pain. I have joint pain. But is that really something that's fibromyalgia? And so right. sa same thing happens with a lot of these kind of uh, GI issues that we don't really know what to do about it. And so, you know, IBS would be kind of the compilation of symptoms that we don't know what's causing it in conventional exactly. medicine. And so we just say, oh, you have, you know, IBS. Yeah. Same idea. I, I totally agree. And I'll tell you, it's my personal theory. And you may share this or you may not. But I think so many of the autoimmune conditions and the inflammatory conditions are perhaps they're either caused by leaky gut or they're worsened by leaky gut. And I'm talking about the full gamut of autoimmune, the full gamut of inflammatory disorders. And I think that's part of the reason that when you, when somebody switches from the stupid American diet or the standard Western diet and switches to keto, I think that's why all those weird symptoms like my joint pain went away, right. my, you know, my chronic, uh, bloating and gut pain got better, my chronic this, that, or the other. I think that's why those, because, you know, a lot of people are like, how does that make any sense? How did that even, how did keto mm -hmm. have anything to do with that? Right. And I think, I think part of it is that your, your body is built of what you eat. And so when you start giving it better timber, it's going to build a better house. I think that is part of it. But I think a lot of it has to do with leaky gut. Yeah, and I agree with you on that. And, and I think, I mean, there is no um, controversy in the sense that, you know, your gut is about 70% of your immune system, right? And right. so one of, one of the major mediators of inflammation, just in general, is something called TNF-alpha. And so there are studies that look at, you know, when you have permeability, TNF-alpha actually goes up tremendously. And that's really the, the, the major kind of pro-inflammatory cytokine that, and we use, you know, big words in medicine so that we sound smart, but yeah. it's, you know, it's a pro-inflammatory molecule that really drives uh, inflammation. And so when you are changing your diet to keto and you're reducing that inflammation, then yeah, it makes sense because that TNF alpha is going to then drive immune responses. And those immune responses are going to attack wherever, you know, you have a predisposition. You know, I think that most people have a genetic predisposition and then, you know, inflammation triggers it for some reason. So whatever drives that inflammation is going to trigger whatever you're genetically predisposed to, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, which there are a lot of studies that look at gut microbiota with, you know, multiple sclerosis. So I think we can use that one as a good example. 
Exactly. And then whatever you're genetically predisposed to, you know, it really just drives, it's like fuel on the fire. And so when you back off the fuel, you know, you don't use the gasoline, then the symptoms get better. Exactly. And now doctors think like this. We just think because we're trained like this. But let me let me explain the tube analogy to everybody so that they can kind of because I'm afraid we'll lose people. And so we think of, you know, just normal people think of, okay, this is the outside of me. But then in there in there, some kind of magical inside of me. And it's not outside. It's not it's not exposed to the outside world. But that's absolutely false. You can think of the human body. As it, when, you know how when you use all the paper towels and you've got just the cardboard tube left? Was that a bad you. day? <laughs> that's you, okay? <laughs> the outside of the tube is your skin, right? But the inside of the tube is your gut from mouth to the other end. Right. And you're, you're actually, what is it, like a, a, I don't even know how many hundred times larger um, surface area in your gut than it is on your skin. Yeah, it's about 400 meters square. So basically, I mean, if you look back at, how we develop as humans, I mean, what you're basically describing is the gut, the the inside part of your GI system actually develops on the outside. And you do this crazy inversion where basically you kind of like invert in yourself. And so you basically surround that gut and all of a sudden that outside becomes the inside, but our body still views it as something that's foreign, that's on the outside. Absolutely. so So we've developed all these mechanisms to basically defend ourselves from everything that's coming inside of our mouth. So right. that, you know, we worry about like environmental toxins. We worry about, you know, sun exposure, all these things that we worry about that are on the outside. But then when you tell somebody, look, everything that you're doing doesn't really matter if the food that you put into your body, which is massively more uh, influential in terms of the impact on your body, right? So you have all the surface area that's being influenced by what you're putting in your mouth. And if you're not careful of what that is, well, all those things are going to be influencing your body in many different ways. Absolutely. So if I took a, a, a supersized McDonald's French fries and I rubbed that all over the outside of my body, don't get carried you, away, Lamansky. You need to do a video of that. <laughs> then, well, then I would, that, that, <laughs> that supersized yucky vegetable oil fried, supersized fries would come in contact with about two square meters of meat. Right, right. Because I'm right. a big guy. I probably about two square meters of skin. And I don't know why you, we're using meters when we're in America, but anyways, because <laughs> that's how we were taught. We don't know any better, right? I know. And, Sorry, but guys. But if I but if I eat that supersized fry, then it's yeah. in contact with about 400 square meters of right. my. It's still my outside, even though it's inside, and it's in contact with it for two or three days. Right. And so that's why you think when you eat something, it just disappears and goes to a special magical place. But it's in contact with you all the way through. And you're, you have a much larger surface area on the inside than on the outside. And although you have so much immune tissue around your gut, to, because it's still your outside, that's why we have all that Im- immune tissue, including Correct. your appendix, right, including your tonsils, because they're all trying to guard the inside, outside part of you. Right. But they can't if you constantly feed your gut junk. And so that's Correct. where all these issues come from. Correct. And if you think about it, it's, it's extremely complex, right? And so at the same time that it's trying to defend you from all the stuff that you're putting in it, plus the bacteria, plus, you know, like my children you mentioned are in the beach, you know, putting their hands in their mouth while they're getting bacteria. They got to defend themselves from that. Viruses, you have to defend themselves from that. So it's a very complex system where you want to protect, but you also need to then absorb whatever macro and micronutrients you know that you're consuming so that your body can survive so it's probably one of the more um, developed part of our systems that we don't really pay much much attention to right right yeah the gut has probably i don't even know how many times more immune mediating cells than your skin does and then also there's almost as many neurons in your gut as there are in your brain and i the different authorities right. argue about that some say there's actually more but you have, it's basically your second brain, and right. it, it is your primary immune defense system because it's such a large surface area. Exactly. Yeah, no, and it makes sense. And so maybe we can talk a little bit about some of those mechanisms without getting too nerdy because I know you like to get nerdy. But um, <laughs> there are a few things, and I think, at least from my brain, when, when I conceptualize it and I look at it and I say, okay, well, what are the defense mechanisms that we have? And then we can look at, Okay, how do we break those down to allow for leaky gut syndrome? 
Absolutely. Cool? Yeah. Let's go. Let's do it. So, okay. So, I mean, and really what we're talking about at the end of the day is, is the colon, right? So the small intestine, but mo mostly the colon, because that's really where you're going to get most of these issues that we're describing. But still, in the small intestine, you get absorption of a lot of these um, micronutrients, macronutrients. But again, when you look at the body, you really want to defend against bigger molecules. And so in order to absorb glucose or fructose or proteins or fats, you got to break them down in the GI system into the smallest components. And then those components can be absorbed by cells lining the gut. But the bigger ones, you know, you don't want to absorb those because that's really what we're talking about with leaky gut. And bigger things would be like larger proteins, but also things like bacteria, viruses, and some of the things that they produce. Right. And so there's a couple of things that, you know, we use as defense mechanisms. And really, if you think about it, the, the lining of the gut is basically one cell layer thick. And those cells are linked together by something called tight junctions. And those tight junctions, I always describe them as like Velcro. Yep. And so they allow the cells to be next to each other without letting things that shouldn't be going through go through, right? right? Because most of the nutrients have to actually go through the cell membrane itself, either through right. a transporter or through some sort of phagocytosis. They don't, things don't normally go between the cells. That There's nothing right. supposed to go between there. And that's why right. we call that the tight junction. But that's also the cause of disease. If you do something that, that causes those tight junctions to loosen up, then you right. start getting more than just basically amino acids and fatty acids and, uh, and, 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 and sugar molecules. You start getting whole, like, not whole macroscopic particles of food, right. but larger pieces of food and larger bacteria that should never be able to get into your bloodstream are able to get in if you piss off your tight junction. And we're Correct. going to talk about how, what does that and then what happens when that happens. Yeah, and one example that I usually will use for people to kind of uh, conceptualize, so when we look at sepsis or septic patients, people who are very, very sick, right, they have basically this massive immune response to some type of bacteria usually. And, then, and the worst one usually is something called gram-negative bacteremia, which um, is a good example because those bacteria will make something, and E. coli is you know, probably the most common, and so I'm sure people have heard about E. coli. And you normally have E. coli in your gut, but let's say you get really sick, and so what happens is those E. coli produce something called LPS, or lipopolysaccharides, right? And these are an example of these large molecules that shouldn't go into your bloodstream. Right. But if it does, meaning that your gut is basically not able to protect itself from this inflammation, then what happens? It goes into your bloodstream, and you mount a massive response, immune response, and people will usually die from that. Nowadays, you know, we're very good in terms of modern medicine that we can help people get through that, but we have to use, you know, crazy medications to do that. Right. And then long-term long wise, you know, they still have pretty significant deficits from it. Absolutely. But that's usually, you know, one of the bigger proteins that we see and, and something that we have to be concerned about. But um, yeah. another good example is when you're, let's say you have cancer, breast cancer, any kind of cancer that doesn't involve the GI, but we give you chemotherapy. Well, same thing happens, or radiation therapy, same thing happens, right? We destroy the gut lining. And so you get what? Nausea, vomiting, bloating. You get all the symptoms that really may be associated with your Western diet, but just, right. you know, obviously magnified. And again, same thing's happening. You're destroying that gut lining. Right. And, so you're and you're much more susceptible to infection right. because, of that because of that loss of integrity. That's exactly right. Exactly. Um, other things I think, you know, obviously HIV, AIDS, but even things like chronic kidney disease predisposes you to infections, which is why in the hospital setting, People who have end-stage renal disease on dialysis, you see them in the ICU setting a lot more with these bad, bad uh, infections. Same idea. Yeah. So um, I think a couple things we can talk about in terms of the mucosal layer, because that's something that I think maybe is not understood enough. And there's a couple things that really will damage it and protect it. So when you get down kind of into the colon area, you have a mucus layer, and it's a external and internal mucus layer. Think of it like really bad snot, right? Yeah. So, but good it's snot. Kind of the, it's good the, snot. The good kind. Yeah, yeah. you're a good kind. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you're a weird dude. <laughs> no, you so, want that snot. You want that snot. To you be want running. it. Yes, it's good. Right. 
it's a mucosal layer that basically allows for a barrier between the gut, you know, itself, the bacteria, the viruses, and the actual cells. It's like a defense mechanism, right? It's like right. when people put sunscreen on their skin, it's the same idea. They're trying to create a barrier between, you know, the sun and their skin. But things can actually destroy that. And one of the things that destroys that is bad bacteria that's created from a Western diet. So when you eat junk food, basically, you're allowing for a growth of this bad type of bacteria and not for the good type of bacteria that we want, like bacteroides and things like that, that protect and actually create some of the mucus layer. And so that's another reason to go from Western diet to more of a low carb or keto diet is because you, you try to influence the good type of bacteria that you need to protect that mucus layer. Yes. Um, you know, other things like ibuprofen, aspirin, even high amounts of alcohol will destroy that mucus layer. And so you really want to kind of avoid those things as well. Absolutely. And that's why if you take too much ibuprofen, you're actually more susceptible to infection. That's one of the reasons why after a bender, after you've been, you know, on the low carb cruise and drank too much alcohol, then you're more likely to get sick because your tight junctions have loosened up because the alcohol has irritated your gut. Exactly. Exactly. And so what's really cool about this stuff, though, is it's pretty new, actually. So in terms of uh, medicine and, and medical research, really, we didn't know about this until about 2004. So it's not that old. And so a lot of things that we're learning, I mean, there's massive research, um, you know, in terms of all the things that we're talking about in the last five years or 10 years. But basically, when, you, when you're going keto and you're really focusing on, you know, those healthy ingredients, you're allowing your body to basically do what it needs to do, which is to repair itself, create that mucus layer, and right. allow for those tight junctions to um, come back together and protect your lining. Absolutely, and it's really, it's an Eastern medicine concept because Western yep. medicine, we always think we have to add something to the system. You add right. a pill, add an injection, add an IV. But right. this, this is more of an Eastern concept. So when you go from the standard American diet to a ketogenic diet or carnivore or you know vegetarian keto, what you're doing is you're subtracting all the bad things. And so you're right. leaving the good and taking the bad away. And that's why your gut calms down so much when you start eating the right food. Yeah, no, well said, well said. Exactly. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I mean, I get a lot of questions in terms of, you know, do you need to eat fiber when you're on a keto diet? What do you think about, about that? Well, I'll tell you what, I've really been diving deep into this lately. And I, I was just listening to a podcast uh, with Paul. Help me with his last name. Oh, yeah. Good luck. Yeah, love that yeah, guy, man. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I've been watching him for a while. Um, Siobhan, Sorry, do you know this guy's last name? He's all about fiber and he's all about the gut. Man, anyway. He's, so a, that, he's a PhD in Stanford, I think, right? Well, no, he's a, he's a sports medicine guy from some other country. But, but he, he just basically has made fiber his his uh, nom de plume because he's like, okay, because he was writing a chapter in mm -hmm. a nutrition textbook and it was about fiber. He's like, okay, I'm not just going to regurgitate the normal stuff we were taught. I'm really going to dive right. deep into this. And so the deeper he, he dove into this, the more he was like, dude, there's no research that shows that we need any fiber at all. What the hell? And so he kept digging and he kept looking. And it's like, we, we always start every journal article with, Oh, fiber is great. Fiber. You know, it, it increases gut mo motility rates, but then that's it. Then when you start digging down into the numbers, it's like, no, the fiber didn't do anything. What are you talking about? That's just your opinion. There's no, and so he is becoming more and more of a fibers optional guy. And after seven months of at least 97% carnivore, I'm kind of starting to agree with him because I mean, I've maybe had five grams of fiber every two weeks for the last seven months and everything is fine. Everything is regular. Everything is great. And so I'm not so sure about our daily requirement for fiber. What do you think? Yeah, again, I mean, you know, I've been doing kind of the carnivore for the last three weeks. Um, bowels are regular. I have no problems. The only issue I wonder about is, you know, the short chain fatty acids that you make from, from the fiber. Right. So things like butyrate, um, you know, I'm still on the fence about that. And so right. I don't know because, because there's not enough research. I know there's a lot of research in terms of butyrate and the importance of that, which you get from, you know, fiber from the short, from the bacteria, you know, basically uh, fermenting the short chain fatty acids. 
or for, excuse me, uh, fermenting the fiber. But um, I guess the question is, are you getting enough fiber to do that by doing, you know, keto? And I right, think you can. Exactly. Like, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't necessarily think you need to be eating, you know, pounds and pounds of fiber or taking Metamucil or any of those supplements. Like, I definitely wouldn't uh, recommend that. Right. Dr. Paul but, Mason is his name. I, yeah, I actually, yeah, yeah. I snuck okay. and looked it up. Love, I love his work. So you weren't listening to me. You were looking it up. Thanks. Quickly, man. quickly. Just, I, took, I did. Just, I took a peek. But, but it's such a, I don't know, it's such an intellectual way he's thinking about this. It's like, yeah, let's not just, let's not just blindly believe any of the old dogma. Let's look at right. everything with fresh eyes. And I think we're going to have to do that with a lot of nutrition uh, laws that we're like, oh, no, you yeah. know, everybody knows you have to have this or that or this or that. I think the more thousands and thousands of people do carnivore or meat heavy keto, eat no fruit whatsoever. I think we're going right. to at some point have to go, dude, we need to reexamine everything, even the I vitamin so. RDIs, the, the, the RDI for fiber. I think we're going to have to look at all that stuff with fresh eyes. Yeah, you know, the thing is, I think all the, the major kind of research in terms of nutrition back in the day was based on the concept that we were eating, you know, basically glucose-based diet, right? So Western diet. Right, right. Uh, maybe not <clears throat> like the fast food kind of diet that we have now, but it wasn't based on, on a keto diet. Right. And so w we don't know a lot of things in terms of how the body's going to react through keto in terms of these questions because there's no real, like, significant scientific research on it. Having said that, I know you've experienced with multiple patients and yourself all the benefits with being keto or low carb or carnivore and same on my end. And so I think that to me is extremely powerful, more so than a randomized controlled trial. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I think that it's very powerful also all of the ketogenic groups out there. And you know, some yep. of these keto groups have almost a half million members. I know. I know. And so if there was going to be a problem pop up with keto, because we are all, we're all free to share, you know, I mean, we all are, are eager to share. We're, we, we don't mind talking about our poop at all because we're all trying to figure this out together. It's like, right? a, it's like a badge of honor. It is. It is. You talk about all your bodily functions because we're all trying to figure this out as we go. And so my current thought on this is, is if there was going to be a problem pop up, it'd be yeah. popping up in the keto groups. And none of us, we don't have a dog in the race, so to speak. We're not, selling keto products and we're not you know like our income doesn't depend on keto being 100 percent right right because we're i mean yep. if me or you if we saw some huge rct tomorrow we'd be like shit i need to <laughs> i need to change my paradigm a little bit because sure. i didn't i didn't believe that but there's the research and i think we're all that way i think we're all eager to learn and eager to look and so i think if there are any long-term problems with keto meat heavy keto or carnivore they'd be popping up in the groups and yeah, I think absolutely. we've got uh, the social media like that is such a powerful tool that doctors have never had before. If they'll get off their damn high horse and start actually listening to these thousands mm -hmm. upon thousands of people. And you can call it an N equals one. But as Sean Baker says, what happens when you multiply one times 10,000? That's right. a pretty meaningful number at that point. Yeah. And I mean, you know, on, on that note with Sean, you know, I mean, he's obviously out there and, and, you don't want to find him in, a, in an alley, but, um, you know, he's that, he's that, what I do like is he's, he's able to show the traumatic life transformation of people who have been vegetarian or vegan and converting over to carnivore, which you yeah. would think conceptually, if you've been eating, you know, a certain way for all your life and you switch over and you automatically start eating meat, you would think conceptually that that would cause a lot of GI issues, a lot of problems. And right. it's quite the opposite. Actually, people seem to be having, tremendous results um despite you know long-term vegan or vegetarianism absolutely uh, yeah on the note of uh, butyrate you can actually get it from butter grass-fed butter exactly so maybe maybe you develop it from that i guess and i think i think that if you eat enough fatty meat grass-fed meat and grass-fed yep. butter i think you're yep. getting enough of the short chain fatty acids i think you're doing just fine with that but that's yep. just my theory now that's not proven science that's just what i think about it currently yeah i agree so um Let's keep talking about, so, I mean, just, just for people who are just coming to uh, this, this episode, you know, leaky gut syndrome is not recognized as a medical disease. So right. I think it's, you know, if you look at the ICD-9, ICD-10 codes, which we use the bill for, for Medicare, you won't find it, right? right? It's more of a symptom that we can say is tied to a certain disease. But you and I, from clinical experience, will say that 
there's definitely an association between leaky gut and a, a host of diseases, right? Absolutely right. Absolutely. And as far and as not research, just diseases of the gut, diseases right, all right. over your body can be right. linked back to leaky gut. Yeah, and I was talking to um, Ellie Miller the other day. I don't know if you got a chance to see that, but you know, in her new book that she's coming out with, basically she's tying a lot of the anxiety, depression that people are experiencing to this gut dysmobility. This, you know, you have a normal microbiota, and that microbiota kind of depends on where you're from, right? Yep. So you and I would have different ones, right? You've discussed way this before. Different. Way, way different. different, dude. Way different. Minor, <laughs> minor, better. So. But no, I like, you know, genetically where you're from, ancestrally where you're from, you're going to have very different uh, microbiota. You know, me being traveling in different parts of the country, you know, drinking probably water that I shouldn't be drinking. <laughs> right. know, I'm going to have, you know, much different microbiota. But, but basically you get a balance. And if you get that balance that's right, then that obviously is, is what your body wants. It's when we start doing things like eating a Western diet where it's full of crap, um, basically that kills the good bacteria that we have when you get this this, this uh, biosis basically is what they call it. And so then a lot of these signals are actually really kind of driving some of these kind of diseases, like you mentioned, but also anxiety and depression. Absolutely. And, and I found it interesting that there are some studies I was looking into this in terms of serotonin levels. So we think of serotonin as one of the major neurotransmitters that we use, right? But actually most of the serotonin is produced in the gut. That's right, way more. Way more. And so if you have a dysbiosis uh, of the gut, you can actually stop producing the uh, amount of serotonin that you need. Or you can actually produce a massive amount of serotonin. And so either one is basically going to unregulate your neurotransmitter and cause, you know, potentially anxiety and depression. So there's all Absolutely. these things that we're learning about the gut microbiota, but also this connection between the gut-brain access through the HPA. Absolutely. And if you, anybody listening, if you're like, yeah, but that's not really how we should be learning this stuff, right? There, we should be doing research to learn this. Yeah, you're exactly right. But yeah. it, I don't know if anybody saw my Twitter post today about the the Harvard, uh, ac, you know, the academic, the professors of Harvard. They're all yeah. in Big Farmer's Pocket. All of them. Sure. Ten, ten years ago they were. Nothing's sure. changed since then. And so they're, all, they're only interested in doing research that's going to culminate in a billion-dollar pill. That's all they care about. And so yeah. all of the big research centers in the U.S. and most of the world, probably, they're so focused on if I can just get this to go through, then I can get a patent on this and then I can make a billion dollars. Nobody's going to research leaky gut because I'm just tell you right now, there ain't yeah. ever going to be a pill for that. There's no nope. you'll never have a pill for that. There's only one way to fix, fix it, and that's to eat the proper food for you. Yeah, just on that note, um, I know it's a little bit off topic, but I was reading this article about uh, Purdue Pharma, and it was talking about oxycotton. So, you know, basically the way it's that egregious. it's uh, it's unreal what they're doing. But so basically what they did, um, and I'll keep it short, but it used to be that the pharmaceutical companies would go directly to doctor to doctor and right. shop their things, right? And I'm sure you remember they would come and give you free stuff, yeah. lunch. They still do. I just don't let they them out do. of the waiting room. Yeah, they just stay in the waiting room. I don't ever let them back. Nice. <laughs> and so what, but what they did, which was smart from a business perspective, but horrible for humanity, is they decided, you know what? Instead of doing that, we're going to go to the big guys. We're going to go right. to Harvard. We're going to go right. to the NI. We're going to go to the big, big dogs, and we're going to tell them. And they're going to tell doctors at, you know, conferences, in lectures, in journals, look, this is what you need to do. You need to prescribe this medication. And so that model has basically been followed by every other pharmaceutical company. And so right. from, like you mentioned, the big dogs, Harvard, you know, John Hopkins, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of them. They basically then tell other doctors, look, this is what you need to prescribe. And then, you know, we follow along. And, um, and if, it, if it were just a matter of big pharma going to them and saying, hey, look, here's all this research, and yep. then the doctor, the, the, the preeminent doctor whose white coat is so long it looks like Princess died as chain, a train at the wedding, he would go, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then he would start teaching other doctors. But that ain't uh, how it happens. How it happens is, is they'll give him a $100,000 grant to do some research for them. Or they'll pay him $10,000 right. for a speaking engagement where he will educate other doctors. And so there's money. And, and you guys know human nature is what it is. When you start rolling off wads of hundred dollar bills 
that corrupts human nature every single time, no matter how ethical the person, no matter how honorable sure. the person, human nature gets involved when money's involved. And so they basically, you, you know, you can call it whatever, but they've been buying off these doctors at the top who are then responsible for teaching the next layer of doctors. And then it's basically trickle down medical ignorance all the way down right. to the, the regular guy like me who's in the clinic just trying to get by. What else do I have to go by? I mean, this is in the American Academy of Family Physicians Journal. This is in JAMA. This is in Nijum. Right. It must be true, right? And so how audacious for a doctor to say, you know what? I don't think that's right. I'm going to try this with my own self. I'm going to step outside the box and try something different. Yeah, you know, it's unfortunate. If anybody's ever interested, what I do is if I read a research article or some guy comes on TV and says coconut oil is the evil of all and being <laughs> There's a there's a website called propublica.org, yep. and in there you can actually type in the doctor's name, and it'll show you how much money they've received and who they've received it from. Yep. And so that's a good way, you know, not not too many people know about it, but it's a good way to like really vet the source and say, okay, well, yep. this guy is saying, you know, this is the wonder drug, but yeah, he's being paid a million dollars to say that. Right. In, and I'm in, actually in a grant. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm actually in that database because I will let the drug reps buy my staff lunch. Sure. And they have to report every dollar. And so yeah. you guys can look me up and it's $50 here, $75 there. And that's where they bought my staff lunch. I walked in, I spent about three minutes, and I left. And because they, I have to sign their book in order for right. them to say it was a, a medical edu edu education, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so if you guys look me up, that's what those are. And I don't, I don't have any thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand dollars. Mine are like thirty bucks, fifty bucks, seventy bucks for they brought lunch for my staff. Anybody ever see Doctor Ken nervous? <laughs> Sorry, dude. Um, <laughs> no, it's fine. I, I, I love it. Full disclosure. Was, man. I, won't I, I looked you up, actually. And there was something about a Ferrari. I don't know. But, yeah, just the uh, once, though. Just the one yeah. time. Okay. All right. It was, it was a toy Ferrari. It didn't count. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Matchbox. Yeah. So, so I'm, getting, I'm seeing some uh, questions scroll through. It's called propublica.org. Yep. Check you, it out. If you can spell it. I can't spell it. But if you can, just Google propublica.org. Yep. And, you'll be and I bet if it. you look up doctors like Dr. Willett. And mm -hmm. Dr. Ornish, I bet you will find huge sums of money by their name because Benjamin's they are raining. Yeah, they're basically bought out. They didn't get a $50 lunch for their staff. They got much more than that. Yeah. Uh, I'll type it in. Uh, yeah. I'll we'll put a link. People. We'll put a link. You'll put a link? Okay. Yeah, I'll cool. put a link. That'll All right. That'll work. Sorry. That's but I think enough. that's an excellent yeah. example because if Purdue is doing that with OxyContin, mm -hmm. Yeah. Then what makes all you guys watching, what makes you think that Merck's not doing that with their drugs? What makes you think Pfizer's not? They're all doing that. That's the standard way right. they do it now. It's not just Purdue. They're not just the only bad guy out there. That's standard practice now for big pharma is to buy off the guys at the top, and then the, the knowledge trickles down to everybody else. Yeah, and the other thing in terms of research studies that, um, you know, we wonder why isn't there much research out there about dietary stuff? Well, a couple reasons. Number one, they're too expensive, right? So you have to be able to follow, you know, a significant amount of people for a long period of time, and it's going to cost a lot of money. And number two, there's no money to be made from the right. pharmaceutical company, so there's going to be no funding for it. Right. There's never going to be a pill. No. And then number three, though, and which I think is also the most important, is that drug companies are, they have, you know, a time where they have an exclusive right to a drug, patent period. Right. And so all their studies are really looking at, what is this new drug that we're creating, which is usually just a little bit of a change on the old drug compared to standard of care, which is a drug, right? right. And so you're really not getting research studies that are looking at lifestyle, dietary, all the stuff right. that you and I think are important. It's right. really drug against a drug. And so yeah, just to make exactly. you know, more money. And so they never do a research study where they can a new type 2 diabetes medication with the ketogenic diet. That never right. has been done, never will be done because keto is going to win, and then they're not going to be able to patent that drug. Right, right. Or you can get uh, Fournier's gangrene from one of the drugs on the market. Did you see that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. I posted about it, and I, I did a search uh, at, the, at the office, and I had, I think, three people, and I immediately, we called them and said, hey, stop that. Yeah. yeah. And they've been started on it by endocrinologists. I, I never start people on those. 
No, I don't, no, no. We don't. There's no need for them. But there, I had three patients who had come to me from an endocrinologist on them, and we called them and said, "Stop immediately." Oh yeah, no, that was crazy. Sorry, we kind of got off on a tangent, but that's okay. Uh, it's all relevant, baby. Yeah. So maybe we recap a little bit, and then we take yep. some questions. Let's do it. Okay. You want to recap, or you want me to? So, your gut has epithelial cells that are side by side and really t stuck very tightly together because all of the nutrients, let's make this the epi epithelial cells, right? And so the nutrients have to go through the cell membrane. That's how it's supposed to work. In between each cell is the, the tight junction. It's supposed to be very tight so stuff can't get through there. But when you're eating an inflammatory diet, inflammatory vegetable oils, you know, if you're, if you're drinking a lot of skim milk, if you're doing anything that inflames your gut, then that becomes a looser junction. And then big right. things can get in the crack, right? It, it doesn't have to go through the cell membrane, which is basically the ultimate guardian of the, the, the intestinal wall, right? And so if things can just start going straight into the bloodstream, that's when you start getting autoimmune trouble. That's when you start getting an inflammatory trouble. That's when you can really get into a lot of disease that would otherwise be completely preventable if your tight junctions stayed tight. And so leaky gut is when those tight junctions loosen up and things can get into your bloodstream without passing the guardian of the cell membrane of the intestinal epithelial cells. Yeah, good way to say it. A couple of things just uh, to add to that. So, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, vitamin deficiency in people or subclinical vitamin deficiency. Well, when I was looking up the leaky gut syndrome a little bit more, you know, a couple of things that you wouldn't think of. So vitamin A, which you know, we think of not in terms of the gut. So vitamin A actually helps these cells that you're describing grow and regenerate. And so when you do keto and you're eating the fat uh, soluble vitamins, which are mostly A, D, um, and E, you're going to have increase of vitamin A. And so I've never met somebody who's on keto that has vitamin A deficiency. And I, then the I second thing that. is vitamin D also. So I wouldn't have thought of vitamin D as also contributing to the the barrier so it helps with the mucosal helps with the lining which also you get from um basically you know eating keto or, or low carb high fat absolutely absolutely and so yeah i mean it's a win-win for for everything keto go keto absolutely let's do a few questions dr sure. john lamansky of biohack md <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that um that was very smooth um what right uh, flawless <laughs> seamless <laughs> All right, prebiotics and probiotics. What do you think? Yeah. So for years, I was a huge believer in probiotics, and I'm still not opposed to them. I think that they probably do help with everything we were talking about. I think they help uh, with gut health. I still think that. The more, I, the more carnivore I am and the more I study and research carnivore, at some point you're like, well, gosh, man, how, how do you, you kind of jive that with, Oh, we need all this, you know, we got to feed our gut bacteria prebiotics and, and, and we got to have all this roughage. At some point, we're like, wait a minute, let's go back to the drawing board again, right? And right. so now, I don't think probiotics are a bad thing at all. I think they're probably good for most people, especially if you're eating the stupid American diet. You need good probiotic. Do yeah, you agree I with mean, that? No, I don't agree with that. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, most commercialized, well, yes or no. So most co commercialized pro bacteria, um, probiotics are really a combination of four. So, so one of the things that they've kind of noticed is that you want a kind of a variety of bacteria, not so much a, a density of them per se. Yeah. And so, so that's one reason. The second reason is that, you know, by the time it gets to the colon, which is a long transport, it's got to go through the GI system. It has to go through the acid producing right. your stomach. Unless you're on a PPI, then maybe it works. But right. basically, it's going to destroy the majority of those bacteria. Yep. And so I think you're wasting a lot of money, personally. Yeah. I think there probably are, the best way to get your probiotics is to do just what your kids are doing the other day, yep. play in the dirt and kiss the dog on the mouth. That's probably the best way to get probiotics. Yeah, exactly. And go and, and I've, there was a doctor, Dr. Bush, um, who's, who's – very smart and his recommendation was to go to national parks so if you can like when you're going to do a family vacation go to national parks because they're not going to be full of all the toxins and chemicals that oh. life is mm -hmm. because you can't spray there so you're going to get nice. more diverse uh, microbiota from different areas so 
if that's part of your, you know, travel plans, then that would be something to consider when you go there. Be that weird dude who, you know, gets naked and jumps in the mud. That's Absolutely. a great idea. Playing the yeah. dirt at national parks because they yeah. can't do a lot of spraying and stuff there. Nice. Exactly. Nice. Yeah. So you're going to get more of the active <coughs> microbiome that, you want that way. I love that. And then what, so, th but there are some um, probiotics that are coming out that are, are very condensed versions of specific strains that may be very beneficial. And there are some research for that, but I'm assuming, you know, now it's just kind of clinical trials. I'm assuming they're going to be very expensive. So in general, I think, you know, go outside, get dirty. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, stop using those stupid hand sanitizer. Please. Yes, please love, stop. The love of God. Stop yeah. using those hand sanitizer. Those Absolutely. are some of the most dangerous things you can use, especially with your kids. Absolutely. I totally agree. Let your kids play in the dirt. Yes. Okay. Let's see. Any other questions that you've seen? I haven't. I haven't been paying attention. Yes. I've been, typical I've been you. Typical envying, you've been, I've been envying your sun-kissed skin this whole time. I know. I know. It's it's pretty good. You should come out here. My vitamin <laughs> D level is through the roof. Uh, yeah, it's probably I'll toxic. I'll, I'll introduce a... you to Nisha's family. Oh, yeah. That'd be great. We'd go see the cousins. I had a, a patient today yeah. who came, and he was like, oh, yeah, my doctor – uh, he went and saw a specialist, and they checked labs, and for some reason checked the vitamin D, and his vitamin D level was 102, and they were like, "That's toxic. Stop taking that vitamin D immediately." And I was like, really? So he said, "I stopped it. I, that's what I was. I was like, no, dude, just decrease it 20 percent. If your vitamin D had been 80, I would yeah. have been very happy." And so yeah, and so he started. He instead of taking 10,000 a day, he's just going to take seven or eight thousand a day, and so his vitamin D level will be 70 or 80. But that doc didn't know anything about vitamin D and what we were just talking right. about. And so he flipped his shit and literally used the word toxic. It's at toxic levels. And I don't know if you've dosed vitamin D much, but I've been giving my patient with vitamin D for 10 years. And yeah, about it's very two hard. Or three, yeah, about two or three people a year I'll get that they, come, they go above 100. And I'm just like, yeah, decrease your dose 20% and that's perfection. Yep. Yeah, just it's nothing. Just chill a little bit. You're yeah, just die. chill. Take a breath. Uh, yeah. That's right. Uh, just before, it's not a question, but uh, Denise Ray said that she just got news today. My fatty liver is gone. Beautiful. That is Beautiful. Awesome. I love it. I Congratulations, love it. Denise. Yeah. That's awesome. Keto uh, Chris, on, Denise. Christy asked, can we do a video discussing the difference between paleo and keto? Yeah, we could do that. Yeah, I wonder if enough that. people would be interested in that. We could do that one week. Just discuss the differences and why we think one's better. Yeah, we could definitely do that. Yeah, um, we'll talk about it. There is a, a, a question about leaky gut regarding uh, ADHD and other child disorders, maybe like autism. What yeah. are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, I think Allie Miller is on the right track. Mm -hmm. I think that it's probably 15, 20 years from now after the research has actually been done. Not yep. research trying to get an FDA approval for a patented pill but research actually looking for how can we make this boy with ADD better, I think that you're going to find that what you feed that boy is going to matter tremendously. Mm -hmm. And more importantly is what you don't feed that boy, right? right. And so I think, I think the tight junctions have a big deal to do with that. I think the fats that you feed him that become part of the cell membranes, I think that's a big deal. I think if he's eating enough fat, he's getting all of his fat-soluble vitamins. That's going to help make his mucosal membrane better. But right. also his neurons are going to be made of a better quality fat. Like Siobhan Huggins, we were talking the other night on a live. If you're eating tons of vegetable oil, some of that's going to get into your cell membrane, right? And so you're going to have this inferiorly made cell membrane. And if that hat cell happens to be a neuron, then it's probably not going to fire properly. And you're probably going to have some kind of mental issue, whether it's anxiety, depression, bipolar, or ADD. I totally think food's what that's all about. What do you think? Yeah, no, 100% agree with you. I mean, you know, I think fructose uh, in terms of ADHD, I mean, if anybody's uh, watched that movie, um, The Magic Pill, Seeing yes. the Transformation. I mean, so, you know, basically when you look at uh, neurons, and I know we're on a tangent again, and I know you have to leave soon, but um, <laughs> when you're looking at neuron kind of health, I mean, you can use glucose or you can use ketones as energy. And really, when you're on a glucose kind of roller cycle, you're going to have these ups and downs, and the brain does not like wide fluctuations in glucose or in blood pressure, right? right. And so 
Right. When you have these huge spikes and huge drops, people don't do very well. And so anything right. that's like a traumatic brain injury, autism, anything that has to do with brain health, when you get a consistent energy source from the ketones, and you know, epilepsy is a prime example, what happens? Well, then you don't have these huge fluctuations. Even if you do with the glucose, it doesn't matter because your cells constantly have energy. Right. And they're also showing, you know, Diagostino is looking at this quite a bit with ketones in terms of exogenous ketones and things like traumatic brain injury, navy divers, seizures, things like that, where if you're giving exogenous ketones to some of these people, uh, they have significantly decreased inflammation in the brain. Their symptoms are ma magically improved. So 100%, I think um, there's a reason why we're having this massive surge in autism, right? And so yep. it used to be that it was a rare disorder. The question is, have we started recognizing it more? Maybe. But when we have one in eight children who has autism, and it's projected that in the next two generations, it's going to be one in four, yeah. there has to be a correlation between obviously lifestyle, but also dietary issues and, and, and these diseases. I mean, how could there not be? Right. Absolutely. I don't think we've been, we, we, we haven't been missing one out of eight kids having autism and us just somehow missing that diagnostically. That hasn't been happening. I think no. probably the di diagnostic criteria is more known now and sure. maybe a little more lenient. And so, yeah, that is a, that's maybe 10% of the reason, but 90% of the reason is the food that you're feeding those babies. That's what's doing it. Absolutely 100%. right. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Lemansky, I'm going to have to get off here. I've got another thing coming up. Dude, it's always a pleasure to touch base with you and to find Likewise. out where you where you are in the world. I'm uh, I'm I'm happy that you had your shirt on tonight. I appreciate that. And so I don't know what we're going to talk enough, about. Dude. You didn't pay I don't me know. enough. <laughs> right. I don't know what we're going to talk about next week. Uh, if you guys have any ideas, leave them in the comments. Yep. And we'll come back and we'll kind of take an unofficial poll and figure or out what we're going to talk about. Yeah, send us an email. Yeah, that'd be good too. But we'll be back next week. Uh, what time? When, what time are we here next week, Nisha? Same time. It's not. This is the wrong. Is this the right day? Or are we off a day? So Tuesday at six, Central uh, Standard. Alzheimer's kicking in, huh? <laughs> no, I don't do this. I'm not the scheduler. <laughs> yeah. But so so next week, Tuesday, six p.m. Central Standard Time. Sounds What's good. What's that in Puerto Rico? Five. Seven. I'm sorry. Yeah, seven. Wrong yeah. direction. Yeah, got it. <laughs> All right. Get that Peace. fish oil in, okay? All right, brother. I'll see you next week. All right. Take care.